Uh, right, hello uh, everybody. Welcome to today's uh, Trend Signal podcast. This is Adrian Booby here speaking, and I'm here with Jerry Miller. Hello, everyone. Hello. Uh, so it's the 25th of November, 2019, and a lot to go through uh, in today's session. So thanks very much for being online with the live session. Um, you can always test out the uh, chat box, the questions box, by typing something in there. And remember, one of the real benefits of being in the live event uh, is your ability to type and interact, get involved, and so on. And we've got a couple of polls that we're going to be pushing out a bit later on, so your ability to actually uh, answer some questions at the click of a button uh, a little bit later. But before we do that, um, we're going to get into the markets and have a look at what's been happening over the last week or so. So, Jerry, um, please kick us off. What happened last week? Um, pretty narrow, some of the markets, aren't they? Yeah, it's all a bit uh, quiet, really. Uh, I, I guess uh, the markets are sort of waiting on key events. You've got the US-China trade negotiations. You've got this impeachment hearing in Congress. Uh, it, it's, nothing's going to happen with that. But the markets are remaining sort of quite resilient, really. Um, stock markets, uh, my reading on it is they were marginally up last week I'm in a mixed bag really but yeah. just sort of waiting for the next sort of move really it looks like yeah we had a in a nice short on the DAX uh, last week uh, we took a you know quick profit on that one uh, very very much against the trend um, but nothing yet on the US indices I haven't quite decided to turn over the waiting really yeah no we, we, we I mean if we just look at the chart very quickly yeah, yeah. Um, looking at the S&P 500 the broadest stock market uh, in the US, in fact, and the globe, um, it really represents the bulk of corporate America. Just keeps on going up. It looks as if, you know, we had a couple of days last week when it looked as if it was going to turn. And it's but, just so resilient. It doesn't want to give up. It needs some sort of, you know, like we talked about last week, some sort of unforeseen uh, sort of shock, yeah. uh, which, of course, we don't know what's going to be yet. Otherwise, that, it wouldn't be a shock. As that, we discussed. That, that, but, that's uh, right. But when yeah. we talk about surprises, what sort of surprises do you think could happen? It's like, well, that's going to be a surprise. <laughs> the surprise is I won't know. Uh, but yeah, it, it's the, the, the markets are. It's it, it's a tough time of year to try and short these stock markets. They tend to do quite well. So there are a lot of seasonal factors, and I know we're going to talk about that in the in the, in the minutes to come. But that, that has a big play on people's mind, and and it's not a good week to be shorting the market in Thanksgiving week. I know that much. Yeah. Well, it's funny. I think last last year we had a bit of a sell-off into uh, in November, didn't we? Last year, I think. Well, right, yeah, but it's more December, wasn't it? December was a yes. big sell-off. Um, yeah, you're right. What actually. happened around uh, Thanksgiving? I'm not sure, but it tends to do quite well, and uh, the markets tend to sort of downgrade expectations on on the retail sales because this is all this week. Black Friday, they call it Black Friday week here in the UK, but in the US they call it Black Friday and then you've got Cyber Monday. And all the retailers, they downgrade all their expectations. They always tend to do better than expected. So I think it's um, a risky business trying to short the market. Not that we are shorting anything at this stage, but, you know, when you hear some commentators say, oh, it looks really toppy, this isn't this isn't good, etc., etc. And I just think the, the market does not tell me at this stage that it's going down. Sure. Uh, and yet, um, someone in the workshop this morning, I think they referenced an article that said the Dow was going to go to 40,000 or something yeah. stupid, uh, as, as, as we discussed afterwards, probably written by somebody who was long, uh, I would say. Yeah. I mean, if you think about, you know, the commitment of traders or the, or the bullish consensus, how many people are long? Anyone who trades the market, anyone who invests in the market, certainly in the US, they're already long. Hmm. They're not going to say, oh, it's going to 40,000, I must buy it. They're saying it's going to 40,000 because they're already long. They want a reason to get out, not to get in. They want a few people to buy their stock off them. Yeah. <laughs> the old uh, phrase, there is no alternative. If you do take your money out of the stock market, you've got to decide where to put it. And there aren't many places to put money from the stock market. Not yeah. in that quantity. Bonds, commodities, foreign exchange, cash, shove it under your bed, give it to your wife. Bye bye. <laughs> no, <laughs> give it to your husband. Bye bye. <laughs> so, so what about the UK election then? I mean, I, I look at you know Sterling. I look at um, the, the UK uh, FTSE 100. Certainly, Sterling pretty flat over the last few weeks, really. Um, so, what's driving these UK markets? Well, uh, it, it's no longer Brexit. Well, it is Brexit, but that's what's driving the UK election. But really, what we're now looking at is not Brexit per se. 
although the parties, the three main parties, are clearly defined by their position on Brexit, apart from Labour, who have decided to sit on a fence. Neutral, yeah, a neutral position. Not, someone said not sitting on a fence, Jeremy Corbyn sitting on a pin. <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, the, the markets basically now become very sensitive to the polls. So that's what affects the market. And of, I say typically a conservative government is going to be well received by the markets. And so Sterling and the FTSE will do well on the back of a Tory win. And likewise, a, a Labour government uh, with such extreme tax and spend plans would be catastrophic, certainly for the markets, certainly for Sterling. Uh, so really what we're left with now is we're looking at the polls. So you'd certainly see some of those stocks that they've been talking about nationalising would, would, would dump. They're not going to pay for full price, are they? So it'll be, uh, well, you'd expect, I assume they're, they're allowed to not pay full price, but well, you'd well, expect they, them to... Yeah, well, that's interesting, because what, what I read over the weekend is that the likes of SSE, and I think, is it uh, the main generators? Um, anyway, whoever they are, they've now gone and set their companies up offshore because of the treaties that the UK's got with certain offshore centres where if there's any acquisition, full price has to be paid for the shares. They can't. Interesting. And, and so this is a protected play by these companies, not because they want to be offshore, not because they want to do anything clever, but in terms of tax, they just want to make sure they get full value. So if they have like an ADR or something like that, then it brings in different rules yeah. and commitments. So, but but That's interesting. I still think the likelihood of any... Uh, Labour government, minority or majority government, is quite slim, uh, and it's something that we, it's worth looking at in terms of those polls. Uh, you know, I mentioned that that's what the market's reacting to. This is the BBC website, very easy to get to. If you go to the news section, click on election 2019, and then click on poll tracker. Uh, and this is a poll of polls. Uh, it was updated over the weekend on Saturday, I think it was. Uh, we were looking at 40.29. It's now 41.29. 41% to the Conservatives, 29 to Labour, 15 to Liberal Democrats. You know, Brexit Party is continuing to lose uh, votes or, or support. But I think that's consistent with this message. Uh, I think the, the, the weird or the disappointing thing for the current setup is certainly for the Liberal Democrats who have floundered in the polls. Uh, they've been falling relentlessly for the last uh, yeah. couple of months, really. Uh, but that, this, this really tells you that the Tories have got a lead of 12%. There's another one called Politico. Uh, I know we were discussing that before, Adrian, but this, uh, this is Politico. This has got a slightly wider margin for the Tories of um, uh, 14%. But some of these, uh, this, this, these are, are moving averages as such. They're not reacting to the latest poll. They look at a... Uh, a collection of polls and take an average. Yeah. Uh, Politico have got a different selection of uh, polls, but it tells you that the likelihood of a conservative uh, victory are quite high. Uh, whilst the Labour have been gaining ground, but they've not been gaining extra ground over the Tories. In fact, the Tories have continued to build on their support, rising at a faster rate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And and what's interesting is. Um, and again, we've talked about this, the, some betting sites, Sporting Index is a good one. Uh, if you want to have a look at that, they've got political bets here. And you can actually bet on the number of seats that each party are going to get. Uh, the magic number is 320. Well, it's magic number 326. But it, when you exclude Sinn Féin, yeah. you never vote. So their votes are excluded. And if you exclude the Speaker, uh, a government to have a majority needs 320 seats. So you can see with 345, uh, if the Tory party were to get that, they'd have a majority of 50 seats. Mm. Remember, it's the difference between 320 and 345 times two, because if the Tories are getting those, the other com yeah, combined parties are not, yeah. are not getting them. Yeah. Um, so you can see it's, the message is sort of quite consistent across both Sporting Index, the BBC and Politico. But that's now. But we had that this time uh, at the campaign in 2017, mm. uh, when Theresa May uh, asked... Um, I think the Conservatives probably already on the slide by this point, but it'll be interesting to see. Well, you're, you're right, they were. But they weren't on that much of the slides, and it's nothing is taken for granted, and it was quite interesting. Um, you know, we, we were talking earlier on about the uh, Conservative... Uh, manifesto. Manifesto, yeah. I mean, 
low key i thought it was low key what a weird day to release it well it's almost yeah weird on the weekend but also weird that you know by comparison you've got some of the conservatives talking about the three billion a year uh spending or something uh, net increase, whereas the Labour's about plus 90 billion or something. Yeah, and something it, ridiculous. It, but it doesn't yeah, yeah. In, include the cost of nationalisation. It, it it defies sort of belief in some quarters. And there's some very interesting articles, certainly the White Times on Sunday, uh, Sunday Times, uh, with a very good article by David Smith, who it just lacks, the thing was, it did, the, the Labour plans lack credibility. And if they lack credibility, it's very difficult for any sensible journalist to sort of suggest that it, it's going to, yeah. it, it makes any sense. It makes sense for people who are going to be in receipt of all this money, but someone's got to pay for it. And yeah. that's the, the big concern. And I guess all this sort of uh, to and fro with manifestos and so on, it, it's just probably leading to a little bit of indecision in the market, isn't it? it hence the sort yeah. of stalemate, if you like, on sterling dollar right now. It's sideways the best part of a month now oh yeah uh, it's, it, really. it, it's been horrendous when you look at uh, sterling dollars you've just mentioned or cable um that's it that's sort of 130 128 range yeah. it'd be fascinating when it breaks either way because yeah. you'd expect a big move either way like the move that actually got us into that range in the first place back in uh, sort of early middle uh, october yeah. so once we break above 130 or break below 128 mm. yeah uh, a big 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 move from there, I, I think. I, I would say the move that you've seen in Sterling over the last three months reflects uh, the increased uh, optimism that um, a sensible arrangement will be achieved at the general election, i.e. the Tories coming in, and not some ghastly uh, Labour Scottish National Party uh, <laughs> some arrangement which we're would apolitical be... here. Well, no, no, but I, I'm, <laughs> I'm no, I'm, I'm market political, as it were. I'm, I'm, I want to know what's right for the market, yeah. and, and my. For our, you know, for all our, from a lot of our standpoint, it 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 would be catastrophic to see sterling collapse. Oh yeah, and uh, stock markets collapse. Uh, you know, generally. But anyway, you know, a lot of things can happen. I remember this time yeah, in the in the campaign with Theresa May, she then announced one of her policies was this uh, uh, about Didn't the elderly having that. to pay for their care if they had assets of more than I think it was a hundred k. And I thought at the time, I said, well, that's sort of all right, but 100K is not going to leave you much, but effectively it meant that everyone's going to spend everything above 100K, and if you've saved all your life, and of course, it wasn't just the press, but the Labour Party came out and denounced it as a dementia tax. Yeah, it's which is toxic a bit, for them in the end. Oh, yeah. God, well, horrendous. It's the last thing you want to announce in the middle of an election campaign. And, of course, the Conservatives lost a lot of votes and probably a lot of seats. And actually a lot of their probably core voters, actually. Which I'd was, say. Uh, which, was, which, was, uh, which was weird. I'd um, say. But uh, a anyway, um, <laughs> Natalie, it's lovely to see someone direct with their view and with good reasoning rather than uh, with an influenced opinion. Thanks, Jerry. There you go. <laughs> That's all right. I, <laughs> I, I did get a bit of a rap, rap on the knuckles by Adrian just then. But, you, you know, one of, one of the things is that you've got to remember is that this economy is a productive economy. And, and Labour are uh, probably looking to tax the productive element of it for the benefit of the non-productive. Now, the, I'm all for social welfare and social security, but it's got to be a fair balance because Absolutely. without a productive side, it doesn't matter how generous you are if we're not generating wealth we can't give it to anyone yeah you know that's the problem anyway i'll, I'll get off that so <laughs> yeah. I'll, 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 I'll let you yeah. you carry on Amy. we could be yeah. here all day agreeing yeah. with each other on that yeah, one. Yeah, but anyway yeah. and um, natalie yeah. Yeah. yeah so look um a big week retail wise uh black friday uh thanksgiving in the states uh black friday is sort of a bit of an import from the states really over here isn't it um what should we be looking out for ghastly import actually they, they now call it Black Friday week. Black Friday is a day. They've now called it Black Friday week. Uh, I, you know, the funny thing is I got back from the pool from my trek and there, were no, there was nothing. And I thought this is different to last year. There's no one's mentioning Black Friday. I then eat my words as over the weekend I've had a, 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 an inbox full. Oh, of yeah. Us. Well, you had Amazon launch theirs on Friday last yeah. week. Costco got an email today that launched theirs today. Yeah. And now it's starting to... Mm. Now it's starting to kick in. But, but, but of course, this affects us a little bit here in the UK. And, and, and as everyone who's listening knows, Black Friday is not a UK issue. It, it's to do with uh, Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving is a, a secular celebration in the United States. So all the markets are shut this coming Thursday. 
uh, and they don't shut early on Wednesday. There was a bit of confusion with some people I was talking to earlier on. Uh, markets have normal hours on Wednesday. They're shut on Thursday, but on Friday, brackets, Black Friday, the market's shut early. Yeah. And that basically means they're shut at lunchtime in the U.S. Uh, the exact time is 6 o'clock our time in the evening, which is 5 o'clock, sorry, which is 1 o'clock Eastern Sea Central Time, Eastern Seaboard Time, and 12 o'clock Central Time. I mention that because there are lots of different time zones in America, but it, it, for our time, it's 6 o'clock in the evening. Don't try and trade after that because the markets will be shut. I was finding it a bit weird that they're closed on the Thursday and then in on the Friday morning. If they're going to give them half a day off, at least let them have a hangover and then uh, yeah. come, well, in, come in for the afternoon. Come in for the afternoon. Well, <laughs> if you think about it, we do that here in the UK, of course. So we get um, Christmas, the market shut early on Christmas Eve and they shut early on New Year's Eve, don't they? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You could say, well, why don't we yeah, have the morning off and come home in the afternoon? But that's that's not the way business works, sadly. Uh, well, it is, but not the way the markets work. No. Anyway, Black Friday, really important, but it's important in the USA. And let's be very clear here. Um, it, it, it's crucial to most retailers' business. And really what happens with Black Friday and on to, you know, December and the run up to Christmas um, it really does set the tone for the entire re retail industry. And actually, I think the, the wider economy in general, uh, because over this period from Black Friday until the run up to Christmas, you know, when everyone's bought their presents, $730 billion is spent in the shops in the United States. I, I looked That's at insane, that. insane, isn't it? I looked at that number, I thought, my God. It's just off the Richter scale. And that's an increase. Uh, it's an increase of... Uh, between 3.8, 4.2% versus 2018. But a lot of it, the increase is not happening in people going to shops. It's you and I buying online. I don't know about you, Adrian. I don't go, well, I don't go to many shops anymore. No. Like, yeah, but to be fair, the American market is quite different to the UK market. The yeah. UK market, we, we do a lot more online shopping. Yeah. Than, in fact, I think it was only really last year, that, or the, earlier this year, that Walmart actually now do um, click and collect. Yeah, that's uh, weird, just their shopping. Whereas we've had that stuff yeah, for yeah. years. Well, I think we're particularly advanced in that. I don't know why we got that bug to buy stuff online, but certainly they're looking to catch up in the United States, and uh, uh, it seems to be happening. But uh, anyway, it, it, it's an important time, as I say, because it sets the tone for the retail sector in the United States. We won't know how it's all done until Cyber Monday. Uh, every day's got a weird name, hasn't it? Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So Monday is when apparently everyone buys online, but it's it's rubbish. They, they're buying online all week long. It's and it, Monday. It's a marketing thing. Of course it is. Some, someone said to me, "Why do why do we why have we started buying um, stuff uh, basis of Black Friday in the United States?" I said, so "This is not us. This is the retailers yeah. badging it and saying, hey, we got a Black Friday offer.'" And a lot of people in the UK don't know what Black Friday is. They just think it's a special day to buy cheap goods. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, you know, one of the things we've got this week, we haven't really gone through the calendar yet, but we've got some US consumer confidence out uh, tomorrow, don't we? Three o'clock. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's going to be a big number. So I think that is a leading indicator, which one kind of sets the tone about how people are feeling right now and how they might spend in the future. That could have a big bearing on how Black Friday goes down. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. I mean, we, we look at lots of data releases uh, in the UK and the US and, you know, people ask me, how do I understand whether it's good or bad for the markets? Typically, if a number's better than expected, and we're talking about something that's forecast, if it comes out better than the forecast, it's generally good for the economy. If it comes out worse than forecast, then it tends to be w worse for the markets. Yeah. And what's weird is that you don't need to start getting your slide roll out and adding up numbers and stuff like that. It's as simple as that. It's not what the actual number is. It's what it was against the forecast that we are most interested in. And, and, yeah, and usually the higher, the, if it's better than forecast, it usually means they're more likely, that country is more likely to now raise rates than it was before, which is more likely to be positive for that currency. Yeah. Yeah, so positive because, and ironically, actually, also can be quite positive for the stock market as well in that country, despite the threat of higher rates, of course. Yeah. Um, anyway, so consumer confidence—it's it, a measure of how 
bullish or how confident consumers feel. And, they, and this is done, there are two surveys, one by this, uh, the conference board, it's called the CV conference, uh, consumer confidence number. And another one's done by the University of Michigan in, in, uh, in conjunction with, I think, Reuters, Thomson Reuters. And, and they're both really well-respected um, surveys. And they tell us how you and I are feeling about buying. And, and if we're feeling good, we will then buy in the future, and that will be reflected in greater profits for retailers and more income for the government, et cetera, et cetera. So it's a really important number. And when we talk about leading indicators, it tells us about future economic activity, not gross domestic product, which is a measure of the value of all goods and services transacted in the previous three months. That doesn't tell us anything about the future. It just tells us what's happened in the past. So I, I do like the, the consumer confidence number. I, I, I think it's an underrated number. I think it should be, I think it should be have a special colour, uh, maybe purple gold or something, because it's a great number that gives us a good indicator about where things are going. How we're uh, feeling. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So um, anything else worth um, uh, commenting on? Uh, German um, yeah. business climate data today. Yeah, we, we 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 were talking about that earlier on, and I mentioned it in our workshop this morning. Uh, Germany has been in the real doldrums. It's largely down to the fact that uh, the US-China trade war has really uh, kicked in. It's affected the growth in China big time. And Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader, has told everyone to tighten their belts. And the first thing that goes is luxury cars. So you can imagine German BMWs, Mercs, and uh, Audis, they've all fallen off the edge of a cliff. So Reed's car Car manufacturers in Germany are struggling, heavy industry is struggling, and you only have to look at this, look at this, this is a chart. But okay, so the German EFO business climate, it's it, it's a measure of how bullish or bearish businesses are. It's a big survey. And you can just you look at this graph here. That's it falling off the edge of a cliff this year. And last year. Yeah. It's been dramatic. And it's as a result of the US-China trade war. That's it. And so there are a lot, there's a lot of talk about, is this starting to bottom now? Is, is the market, is Germany starting to recover? And I think the number today is uh, very inconclusive. 95, yeah, it's better by 0.1, uh, but it's still a shocking number down here. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think it is yet. We had data a couple of weeks ago, German GDP data. Another negative quarter would have put Germany in a recession. The strongest economy in the EU, in the Eurozone, in a recession. Yeah. Italy's in a recession. They dodged it by the finest of fine margin. So, well, that, well, that, that was just on preliminary GDP, wasn't it? I mean, I don't know that the official data might, yeah. might change that. You know? uh, well, it, it, a lot of the, not, not a lot of the data is in on the first number, so it's possible that they could actually end up being in recession. But uh, a technical recession, everyone says, oh, it's a technical recession. A recession is a recession. Oh, yeah. What, what's a recession? A recession is when you're not growing, and if you're not growing for two quarters, you're shrinking. Yeah. It's like Americans, they have negative profits. Yeah, losses. Yeah, we call them losses. They call them negative profits. Yeah. Love all those words. Uh, good. Okay, so obviously we've been talking a little bit about Black Friday uh, and stuff today, the seasons that are coming around. Um, one of the things we want to talk a little bit about is seasonal activity, seasonal things that affect the markets. Can anyone think of any? Can you perhaps pop them into the questions box if you can think of any seasonal factors that might impact the markets? We're going to go through a couple uh, in a few moments' time, but if you can find your way uh, to the questions box, please, if you are uh, watching it on the live uh, session on GoToWebinar, uh, that would be great. Uh, there are a couple I'm going to go through. Uh, gold, yeah, but okay, but what about gold? So what? Um, is it uh, a particular day, month, uh, time of year, harvest? You know, harvest <laughs> gold, of course. But do you know what I mean? The seasonal factors that tend to keep coming around year after year that have a, a, a pattern or a, a well, continual pattern and so on. Gold uh, has them. Yeah, gold does have them. I'm sure it does. I don't know why. Well, well one, one I, I'm not sure uh, who's answered. Uh, Max, yeah. Uh, gold, Okay, uh, it, it's not so obvious, but in 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 India, there's big purchases of gold around uh, Diwali. Yeah, and it's it actually causes a big, you know, a big build in in demand, and with constant supply, it does push the price up. Of course, it's anticipated every year, but there's a lot of gold that's bought around that time. 
And you think, oh, India, you sure? Yeah, it, it happens. Yeah. yeah. I mean, uh, uh, Michelle, Michael, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name, I'm afraid. Uh, Christmas purchases, absolutely. Again, there's also a lot of it's perhaps factored in and will come out in the wash in the results as they then come through. Um, people tend to get a bit excited about something called a Santa rally or a Christmas rally. Uh, that tends to be, to be honest with you, uh, something that happens over the, the actual Christmas period. Uh, rather than the month before, people yeah. get a bit excited that it's really a, a, a rally that starts on the first of December or something. It's two it's days. Really it's it two is. days before um, Christmas. That's what it is. But there are other things. There are there are other things that affect it. Obviously, things like a harvest can have uh, you know, traditional impacts on yeah. you know, wheat, uh, soybeans, and so on. Dividends uh, have a continual impact uh, on the price of stocks. Um, so, for example, I can bring up a, a page on screen here. Uh, looking at the likes of, uh, where are we, uh, dividend stocks. So in the UK, in the US it's different, you know, companies come up with their dividends or ex-dividend dates, that's the date at which they look at the register of who owns shares, and that's the cutoff point. If you own shares on the ex-dividend date, when they check the register, that's the, the, you're then entitled that dividend. So a date here you've got here for like British Airways or International Consolidated Airlines Group, um, they have their ex-dividend date on the 28th of November, as do JD Sports, Land Securities, National Grid, Vodafone. So a few big stocks there in the FTSE 100 uh, having their dividends there this Thursday. What this means is that that's when the registers, you don't get paid until a later date. However, this is when you're likely to get a cash adjustment in the share price because it's at that point that the profits, the cash is going to be effectively put aside to pay those shareholders out. So, for example, looking at land securities, 11.6 pence uh, per share dividend, all other things being equal, you would expect land securities group to fall in price by 11.6 pence on Thursday. Um, and similarly, JD Sports by 0.28 pence, not a lot, is it? 16.5 uh, pence for National Grid and so on. So these are things that happen typically on a Thursday in the UK, apart from what's called a special dividend, which might be a big uh, one-off uh, return of cash. SSE had one earlier this year. Yeah, it happens from time to time. But this is something that happens regularly. Uh, okay, so, so what does that mean? Does that mean that we should short stocks every Thursday or Wednesday night? Unfortunately not. Uh, because you get an adjustment in the share price. So if you were to receive that 11.6p dividend, you would expect the share price to fall by 11.6p. So whilst you might well, uh, if you are long, you'll receive the dividend, you're going to see a fall in the capital value of your shareholding. If you were short, uh, you would see the price fall. That's great. But unfortunately, uh, you would have to then pay the dividend to whoever then owns the stock. So uh, effectively, you pay it out, so there's no free money, uh, which is a shame. Yeah. These these blasted brokers, they know how to um, yeah, yeah, tighten it up, I'm afraid. Yeah. Um, but it's always worth knowing what companies are, are having their uh, ex-dividend dates and when. And of course, a lot of people have income portfolios, and it's very important to know when the ex-dividend dates are, how much they're paying, all that sort of stuff. And perhaps that's a topic for a different uh, time. Um, the other thing, uh, of course, uh, is um, first of the month. Uh, does anyone know why the first of the day of the month might typically be quite interesting for stock traders? Uh, anyone? For pensions, payday, yeah, potentially, absolutely. You know, a lot of uh, pension contributions will be going in the payday just before the end of the month. Max, that's a good shout. Typically, what happens is that a lot of money that goes invested in stocks uh, is in funds, pension funds, hedge funds, that sort of thing, predominantly pension funds. So what happens is that as money is invested, a lot of that money is then held in cash, and then it's invested as new units are then created uh, on the first day of the month. So what you have is a, is a segment of cash that's waiting to acquire stocks on the first day of the month. So typically, the first day of the month is actually quite strong for equities. I haven't looked at this for probably a year or two, but I seem to remember, I think the FTSE was trading at around 7,000 at the time, and if you added up the rally or the, the price movements um, for the first day of the month since inception, um, which is what, I don't know, back in the 80s or something, it's about a thousand back in, 80, you know, back in the 80s, about four and a half thousand points of positive movement overall uh, had come on the first day of the month. 
Exactly. So effectively, yeah. that means that at least half, so probably about two thirds of the positive movement in the FTSE over the last 35 years, whatever, has come on the first day of the month. The rest of it accounts for, obviously, uh, quite a small uh, proportion of the rise uh, over time. But of course, it becomes self-fulfilling, doesn't it? Because UV and the gateposts know that this is what happens on the first. So anyone who's looking to sell does not sell on the first day of the month. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're, I don't know if there's, I've, not, I've never worked at a pension fund, but perhaps there's an argument when people are withdrawing their money from their pension, maybe that's done on the last day of the month, maybe you see prices ease back a little bit on the last day, mm. I don't know. But certainly, uh, the first day of the month has traditionally been a very, very strong day. Um, so here we are, uh, 1st of December. I know exactly what's going to happen, 1st of December. You're all going to put a long trades on, it's going to fall 100 points. But... <laughs> <laughs> Oh, but, you well, know, that's, it's that's, one of those things. That's it's, statistics, it's, damn lies and statistics, isn't it? But yeah. seasonal factors are interesting, though, Adrian. I mean, and that's not sort of a seasonal one. It's more of a pattern. Uh, Patterns pattern. repeat themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it's seasonal factors. People ask me, you know, what happens at Christmas and about the Christmas. Forget about Santa Rally. That's a small issue. But typically, markets do remain quite steady at this time of year, and it's quite difficult to sort of. Think about shorting them, and I know in December it did last year. It's optimistic, no, feeling happy, yeah. and so and, on. So generally, we want to go out and buy stuff, and, and, and include stocks. Sure. And that's the first few months of the following year as well. And typically, the dollar does well at the start of the year as well. So with all these things in mind, we're what on the 25th of Nov. In a month's time, it's going to be Christmas, and most people have a, a time off between Christmas and New Year. Before you know it, we're in the New Year. Yeah, and and I. I sort of try and read the tea leaves and think what could cause it to come off. I, I do know a few things that could cause it to come off, but I don't think Trump's going to impe be impeached. I don't think Labour are going to win the election. I don't think the world's going to stop. I do think Brexit's a problem, but we'll get round it. And, um, yeah, it's difficult to see. It probably will be China. It will yeah. be something out, totally outside, outside our sphere, like it is normally. Yeah, well, know. fine, absolutely. Um... Okay, so look, I'm sure there's plenty more that we'll go through seasonally uh, in the podcast to, to come in the future. But what I'd like to do, guys, is just ask a, a couple of poll questions. It's something that uh, will pop up on your screen. So those of you, again, at any live, you can click on the screen. This is a couple of questions here. Just want to get an idea about things uh, that are perhaps holding you back as a trader. First of all, just going to launch this poll. How much trading experience do you have? If you wouldn't mind just popping that on the questions box there, please. Not the questions box. Click on screen, how much trading experience do you have, if you could let us know, is the answer that you've never traded, less than a year, one year to three years, or more than three years, let's see if we can get as many people uh, participating, all you've got to do is click on your screen, uh, and that should operate if you're on the go to webinar session, that is, uh, that'd be great, so we can get plus than 80% of today's attendees, that'd be fantastic, keep that coming, the reason this is useful, because actually if we know uh, the experience levels of people attending these sessions, we know not to talk in too much jargon, you know, to sort of simplify the, it a little bit. And also get an idea about people who are really, really needing uh, for their trading. Which brings me then on to the next question. Thank you very much for that. I'm just going to quickly share the results there. 8% of you in today's session never traded. 42% less than a year. 33% one year to three years. 17% plus three years. So we've got a broad spread centrally. So it's yeah. pretty, pretty yeah, good. Yeah, sort of what you'd expect. Yeah, absolutely. What I will do, though, is just move on and hide, get rid of that. And the next question, and last question I'm going to ask, which is more about your own trading, really. What's preventing you from getting started? If you've never traded before, what's preventing you from getting started in trading? Or what's preventing you from being profitable uh, with your trading? Why don't you let me know? I've got a few sort of stock answers that I've put in there. Number one, and again, pop that onto that, uh, just click on screen there, please, guys. The one or maybe more than one that's most relevant to you. I'm not confident that I'm entering the trades at the right time. I get a bit fearful uh, and I get nervous, which impedes my decisions. I don't think I understand enough to be profitable. I need more training, I guess. I need to know more. I need to understand more about the markets. Uh, number four, it all seems rather complicated and sometimes I feel overwhelmed. I know what you mean by that. Certainly when I first got into it, um, it definitely felt a little bit like that. Or perhaps it's simply a lack of time. So what do you think, guys? other things that are holding you back. And the reason I'm asking that, I don't have a huge amount of time really to go through it today, but what I would like to do is use these as topics to go through uh, and have a look at um, for future podcasts and the future newsletter uh, articles 
uh, that we're sending out as well. So what are we getting here? Let me just close that off. Let's uh, thank you very much for that. Let's get a couple more actually answering there, if you don't mind. I mean, it's interesting. We actually sent um, a an email out last week. Um, you know, what's your biggest trading challenge? And we had quite a few people respond, actually. Um, one person uh, really struggling with their exits uh, on trades. You know, it's interesting. We talk about getting into trades and getting into the right trades is important. Of course, you know, I'm sure you're all familiar with the sniper strategy. And we've got a webinar. If you go on our website, trend-signal.com, you'll be able to register for a webinar where we'll teach you some rules associated with um, identifying and getting into the right trades. But exiting trades is an interesting one as well, guys, because it's your exit that determines how much money you make or lose on the trade. And how you want to exit sometimes depends on your aversion to risk and your attitude to risk. For example, some people like to get in and out of trades very, very quickly because, you know, they, that's just the way they like. Get in small profits, drop goals and, you know, field goals rather than the full converted tries, uh, for example. Equally, some people like to go for the big, big um, bustling move. And the thing about trading is a lot of it is down to those individual personalities. Me personally, what we like to do here is we teach people about how to get started, how to go for those sort of bite-sized gains, get some profits chipping away. And then, of course, as you become more of an understanding about the markets, you become a better trader, we then start to open up your understanding to how to get bigger moves, bigger profits on certain trades. And that's where guidance, statistics, uh, and technology can really help there with that. So the ability to understand where you, are, where you should exit it certainly helps if you know the statistics behind those, uh, really. Um, another one uh, emailed back uh, from our email last week, and I'm going to close off the session in just a few minutes there, guys, but uh, someone who just trade, wanted to trade um, for additional income once a day, um, but was really struggling to get it all down to once a day because of the amount of analysis uh, time there. Um, guys, do, do, do you struggle with simplifying the process why don't you let me know in the questions box are you looking for something about simplify the notion the the concept of identifying the trading opportunities i think i don't know about you joe when i first started to get into trading it was all about chart patterns candlestick patterns and it was all horribly confusing it, yeah it's, uh, actually. it's overly complicated and it doesn't need to be yeah that, that's the issue so um, I'm going to I'm going to get into the detail of your responses um, from today's uh, podcast next week, if that's OK. We can go through, really tackle some of those answers. For example, 56 percent of you in today's session, I don't think I understand enough to be profitable. We're going to drill into that. OK, get into those details and work out how you can understand enough to get you into it. OK, uh, Max there, I seem to sell too early and when I hold a stock, it falls in value, and then I sell it less gain uh, than it was. Again, we can get into those details in next week's podcast as well. So if you'd like to know more about some of those tips to help you to become more profitable with your trading, please make sure you tune into next week's podcast. We're going to go into those details and how we can simplify the process. If you can't wait until then, we do uh, have a couple of live trading events of this week. If you make your way to trend-signal.com, you can register for an upcoming event. We've got three of them this week, Tuesday lunchtime, Wednesday night, and Friday uh, lunchtime there, where we'll teach you one of our strategies and go through a rules approach, uh, to rules-based approach to trading that should be able to assist you as well. Otherwise, guys, so for myself and Jerry, yeah, thanks very much. All the best. Thank you, and we'll catch you all next week. Uh, all the best. Uh, Max, if you want to, go onto the website trend-signal.com and you can book a place on those sessions there. All the best and bye-bye for now. Bye now.